A picture is worth a thousand words. But some pictures, like this one, are worth over 100,000 response time measurements. What we just showed you was only the tip of the iceberg on our updated Monitor 2.0 methodology. Our Monitor response time testing has changed. And not just a little bit. It's a full overhaul. You know and love us for our data, and boy howdy do we have data now. Data you won't find anywhere else. This overhaul includes gamma-corrected response time testing, the use of cumulative average deviation, or CAD, as the main measurement of response time performance, refresh rate compliance, and of course, this new pursuit photo. Hi, I'm Abby from Ratings.com, where clearly we've been working on the most complicated paint-by-number ever. In this video, we'll look specifically at what this new pursuit photo can show you, and how it demonstrates the limitations and advantages of different types of display technology. This isn't just some trivial pursuit, so stay tuned! Before we dive into it, it's important to have a bit of the theoretical background. As the Blurbuster's law developed by Mark Rajon states, displays with one millisecond of persistence will show one pixel of motion blur when a pattern pans at a thousand pixels per second. For example, a 60 hertz display will refresh the image 60 times per second, meaning the image is held on screen for 16.7 milliseconds, or in other words, there's 16.7 milliseconds of persistence. If that image is moving at a fixed speed of 1,000 pixels each second, then what we'll see in a pursuit shot is 16.7 pixels of blur. Doubling the speed of the pattern to 2,000 pixels per second also doubles the persistence blur, making it much more visible no matter your refresh rate. Increasing your refresh rate decreases the amount of persistence blur for the simple reason that the higher the refresh rate, the more frequently your display is updating the image and the shorter the duration that image stays on screen. Thus, a 540Hz monitor updates the image every 1.9 milliseconds, meaning you end up with 1.9 pixels of blur. At 1000 pixels per second, that blur is barely visible to the naked eye. By doubling the panning speed to 2,000 pixels per second, thus doubling the amount of persistence blur, that previously ultra-crisp image looks a little more like this. Still clear, but not as sharp as before since it now has 3.8 pixels of blur. To be clear, a 540Hz monitor will be good at handling motion, but how will you know if it's better than another 540Hz monitor? As monitors increase their refresh rates, it becomes more difficult to tell them apart visually, especially with a photo that only measures three color transitions and lacks detail. With our new methodology, we'll be able to distinguish differences in persistence down to the split millisecond. At the bottom of our new pursuit photo are a series of boxes designed as a moving picture response time or persistence indicator. The underlying theory of this pattern is based on the Blurbuster's law. Basically, the two vertical lines of each box are a set amount of pixels apart, so they'll converge when the persistence is equal to the number of pixels that separate them. Since our pursuit photo pans at 2,000 pixels per second, we had to make some adjustments to this indicator. Namely, we doubled the size of each box, so the one box is actually two pixels wide, the three box is six pixels wide, and so on and so forth. We also added smaller increments for more precision to accommodate faster displays. Convergence looks like this, where you see the box as one smeary larger box. The boxes to the left appear duplicated, while the boxes to the right appear closer to the base pattern. Now the cool part of the MRPT indicator is how finely these increments can go. Using the ViewSonic XG270QG, which uses backlight strobing to minimize persistence blur, we see the convergence between the 1.5 and, and 2 millisecond boxes. It isn't quite one and a half milliseconds since there's underconvergence there. And ultimately, when we measured it, it was 1.8 milliseconds, which shows you just how precise you can get. This particular example is interesting for another reason, though. Can you guess what it is? We'll zoom out to the full picture. It might be a little more obvious now, especially in that S. Even though red looks good on us, it isn't the same story for the image. These red trails are caused by a component in LED backlights known as potassium fluorosilicate, or KSF phosphors. These phosphors emit a deep red light when excited by ultraviolet light. 
That's great, since it can really extend the display's red color coverage, but the unintended side effect is that the red takes a significant time to decay, hence why it appears as a red trail behind a fast-moving object. Many LCD and LED monitors use KSF phosphors, but the red trailing isn't an issue. It only really affects monitors that use backlight strobing to cut down on persistence blur as the backlight rapidly turning on and off activates and deactivates these phosphors. With their long decay time, well, the red lives on, even if the backlight is off. These phosphor trails are but one of the trails we can now see, thanks to our new pursuit photo. Another one has been dubbed the VA's worst nightmare. The pattern itself is very simple. In the bottom left, there's a purple TV on a Hulk green background, but we'll use the Samsung Odyssey G5 here as an example because it really demonstrates what's happening. At a standstill, the pattern seems normal, uh, but once it starts moving, it's almost as though that dark border and long dark smear has always been there. So what gives? What's happening here? And why does it only affect VA panels so strongly? It boils down to the color composition. It has a massive role to play. Essentially, this combination of colors causes an overlap of pixel responses. On the trailing edge, the pixels must change colors from purple to dark green. The red and blue subpixels fall from an RGB value of 127 to 0, then the green subpixel must rise from 0 to 95. On a VA panel, the rising takes significantly more time than the falling, leading to an asymmetrical transition. The purple falling transition takes about 11.5 milliseconds, whereas the green rising transition takes 27.4 milliseconds leaving an overlap period where the RGB value is close to 000 or black. IPS, TN, and OLED panels have more symmetrical transitions, so this extended black overlap isn't a problem. Hence, why this is the VA's worst nightmare. Colors are important, obviously. Games and media aren't usually just black and white these days. While measuring every single color transition isn't necessary, visually seeing a wide array of colors and how they perform is, for the simple reason, maybe there's overshoot. Overshoot occurs when pixels aiming to change colors faster actually shoot past their target color, resulting in an echo or a ghost appearing in the opposite color, which gives it its other name, inverse ghosting. This phenomenon is largely the result of overzealous overdrive settings on monitors that push them to rapidly change colors to make their gray to gray rise and fall times faster, usually at the cost of overall response time. It's easier to show you using the rise and fall graphs on the LG 32 GR93U, a great monitor with horrendous overshoot in its faster overdrive setting. One of the key elements to notice is the shark fin shape of the graph as this is a clear indicator of overshoot. So, if we're targeting an RGB value of 159 from zero, we're going from black to mid-gray. The monitor reaches the gray value quickly, very quickly, in about one millisecond. And then it goes past that because it's not actually targeting 159. It's targeting an RGB value closer to 227. Then it drops and finally hits the baseline quite a bit later. Sure, the initial response time is fast, but to stably reach the target color, the response time is about 15 milliseconds. The old photo with its cyan, red, and white couldn't show this well. Overshoot just isn't as visible when there are only three main color combinations, red, white, and cyan. This is likely because cyan is the inverse of red, so the inverse ghosting artifacts would blend into the cyan background. With our old photo, you could take two monitors, like the Samsung Odyssey G8 OLED and the totally not confusingly named Samsung Odyssey Neo G8, and you'd see that they'd score quite differently in the response time measurements. And the Neo G8 clearly indicates there's overshoot, but their photos look pretty much the same. If anything, the OLED even looks a bit blurrier. In actuality, this isn't quite the case. Interestingly, the artifacts resulting from inverse ghosting aren't as visible against certain backgrounds, like black or white. Against a solid gray RGB 159 background is a different story, though. We can see overshoot from a wide range of colors. All transitions require the subpixels to rise and fall to reach certain RGB values. Even our cyan to red transition was composed of three individual grayscale transitions. 
a solid white RGB 255 or a solid black RGB 0 background are the two ends of the RGB value spectrum. Subpixels falling down to black won't have visible overshoot since you can't go past zero. Similarly, though you technically can have overshoot past 255, it isn't visible nor common. With an RGB 159 background, you're in the middle of the spectrum, leaving ample room for overshoot and undershoot to be visible. With 12 unique colors on the ratings logo, each one of those colors must rise or fall to the RGB 159 value very quickly as the pattern pans. So if the monitor's overdrive settings cause it to overshoot, it's quite noticeable. Of the over 30 monitors we've updated, nearly all of them have grotesque overshoot at their maximum overdrive setting. So sure, while the response time seems quick on account of reaching that target faster, the total response time can sometimes be rather high. Plus, these overdrive modes come at the cost of motion clarity, which kind of defeats the purpose. The colors and visible overshoot aren't the only way we can tell how clear the motion on a monitor is. You might have missed these little details tucked away in the end of the pursuit pattern. These are single pixel details, so if a monitor has a high amount of persistence blur, they're entirely washed out. These fine details can give you a sense of how well text or small elements will look in game while you're moving around. There are so many details in this pursuit photo that anywhere you zoom in, you'll find some new trove of information. It's been a fun little game to try and find every little Easter egg stuffed in there. So let us know in the comments what you've found so far. We haven't touched on just how we take these photos. When the pattern zooms across the screen like that, how do we ensure the photos are consistent and show all the stuff we want them to show? The final detail that we're going to talk about is the four bar synchronization track right at the top of our pursuit photo. This sync track is another brilliant gem from Blurbusters, which we incorporated to ensure our photos are consistent and accurate. How the sync track works is when the camera moves as fast as the image and is fully aligned with it, the four bars will converge into one straight line. If the camera moves too quickly, the top of the line races ahead too slow, and the top drags. Precision, then, is the name of the game. Some of our testers are at the point where they can do it in one pass. This is why I'm not a tester. I'm just the person bringing you the information. This new pursuit photo is just one facet of the update that'll bring our monitor testing straight to the cutting edge. We can finally validate and showcase the user experience right down to the pixel. In the coming months, we'll be working hard to update our most popular models onto this new 2.0 test bench, which, at a minimum, includes 72 rise and fall transitions per overdrive setting per refresh rate. For those number nerds who love data, hope you're hungry! Every review has hundreds, no, thousands of graphs. It actually takes our testing team about 45 minutes to validate over 2,500 graphs now contained within each monitor review. This is just part one in the series of videos exploring the new monitor test bench. So if you're interested in keeping up with it, hit that subscribe button. And while you're at it, feel free to check out the links to further reading in the description below. Until next time, I'm Abby from ratings.com, where we help you find the best product for your needs. The old photo with its, oh, it's not here anymore. <laughs> Well, that's okay. That's our blooper. Well, measuring every single... I was so confident.